Um, so this is our weekly seminar. Um, we have this weekly seminar to um, present new research or um, projects or ideas that people have. And um, I want to thank uh, Daniel for organizing this from the center. He's been really great at coordinating this. And this week, um, I'm really excited to have um, uh, Mitch Tomasho speaking to us. Um, he was um, the person that hired me when I got my position in environmental studies at Antioch University, New England. And uh, so I worked with him for quite a number of years um, before I transferred here to University of Rwanda. And um, we have stayed in touch. So I'm really excited that he's gonna be speaking here today. I think a lot of what he's gonna talk about is very relevant here for my colleagues here in Rwanda. You know, we've been having discussions about um, the importance of, um, of changing from business as usual and getting people to think more about the importance of nature, the importance of biodiversity, and also how we can do that through education. And uh, Mitch Tamasho has been thinking about this for a long time and he writes about it in books. And um, this uh, presentation here is going to be about one of his most recent books and some of the recent things that he's been thinking about. So I think it's gonna be very inspiring for a lot of us. And I just want to remind you, it, uh, keep, please keep your microphone muted. And then when you want to um, ask a question or talk directly with Mitch, then you can unmute. And um, you can also put your um, questions or comments into the chat. And, um, and we'll uh, read from those during the question and discussion time. So with that, um, I want to pass it over to Mitch. I didn't talk a whole lot about um, all your CV and all your other experiences. So you're welcome to um, talk about that, Mitch, as you get started. So thanks so much. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, Beth. And thanks folks for coming uh, to today. I really appreciate it. Uh, anytime you spent extra minutes on screen, I think is, some, is, is a sacrifice in, in a sense, because you're not you're not looking outdoors, but I, I appreciate it. And this is really an international group. Um, we have we have folks from Turkey. We have folks from Rwanda. Um, Beth, I want to thank you and your and your um, staff. Um, you've done such magnificent work in conservation biology, both in the states and in Rwanda. You've really been bold and creative, and how you've moved these ideas forward in such interesting ways. And I know I, when I worked with you in Antioch all those years ago, I learned so much from you about seed dispersal and different ways of thinking about conservation that I'm sure I've, I hope I've internalized and incorporated in my own work. Um, so thank you, Beth. And um, I also want to say before I start that um, my experience is really primarily North America. And um, I want to be clear about that. And I'm reflecting on that. And as it's well, I hope it's relevant for you as well, but I make no presumption about any of that. Um, so it's important that I mention that to you. I wanna tell you a little bit about my work and how, and this book in particular, why I wrote this book and what I hope to accomplish with it. But I'll start um, by giving you a survey of, I guess the full context of what I've done over the years. Um, I worked at Antioch New England Graduate School for a long time, for 30 years, from 1975 to 2000, well, 1976 to 2006. And my generation, um, people in my age group, really built the field of environmental studies in North America. There, when I was in college at New York University in the late 60s, there was no place you could do environmental studies. There were forestry schools and a few fledgling ecology programs, but there was really no field of that sort. And it, it was, we tried the best we could through the years it, at various colleges and universities, through magazines like Orion, um, I'm so glad that Chris is here, to build a field. And I think that that happened. And the field has expanded in extraordinary ways into sustainability in so many different directions. But I also feel that uh, the, the field, to some extent, needs to move forward in new and very dynamic ways because times change. And so the reason why I wrote this book is to make some suggestions about the ways that I think this field must move forward 
And that's what I'm going to be speaking with you about today. I'm going to focus on certain particular areas because I can't cover the whole book. Um, but this is, this, this is the work I've done through the years. I wrote a book in 1995 called Ecological Identity. I was very interested in why people choose an environmental way of life and how that changes the way they think about education, about philosophy, and about spirituality. And then in 2001, I wrote Bringing the Biosphere Home, which is really about learning how you perceive global environmental change. And the thesis of that book essentially is that it's through intimate awareness of local natural history that you really begin to perceive space and time on the whole planet. Um, and so those, that book in particular really led to the current one, To Know the World. Then I was the president of a small university in Maine called Unity College, and I got very involved in helping turn that campus into a sustainable campus. So I wrote a book about not only what we did there, but also what I saw happening throughout the North America in relationship to sustainability. So this book is almost like a strategy portfolio for any campus that wants to begin to move in this direction. But it follows off the previous books because it emphasizes place-basedness. It emphasizes using place to expand your view of the world, but in this case, in the context of sustainability. Uh, so now before I proceed, I wanna make an, another apology of sorts. I'm gonna cover a lot of ground very quickly. It may seem like it's too much. I hope that's impetus for you to read the new book, but I'd like you to see the big picture of what I'm trying to accomplish. And I realize that for some of you, English is also not your first language. So I'll try to speak a little bit more slowly than usual, but also I'm very enthusiastic about the material. So as I proceed, I tend to speed myself up. Uh, so I just want you to know that in advance um, and you're not gonna get everything, but I want you to see the big picture. So that's how I'm going to proceed. This is a book that has nine chapters and I'm gonna cover all of them, some in more detail than others. But again, I want you to see the whole picture. The second chapter about memory, I'm gonna cover last and you'll see why when I get to it. Uh, but I wanna take you back in time one uh, again to 1969 when I was a sophomore at New York University in the Bronx. And of course there was no internet then and it was an amazing time because all these powerful movements were taking place in North America, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement and the anti-war movement. And as a 19 year old in college for the first time, I was fascinated by all of this and I wanted to learn as much as I could. So I would take the subway to the 8th Street bookstore in downtown Manhattan to check out all the new books that were coming out. And one day I saw this one, the whole earth catalog, and it had a picture of the earth on the cover. And I, and I, I bought the book and I looked at it and I was fascinated by how it organized knowledge. Um, and it spoke to me so directly. And I realized that in retrospect, so much of my work has been trying to reproduce this in curriculum at various universities. And, um, and th so this had a major role and a major impact. And I use it as a representation of, uh, of, of how much discovery there was in that era. I, I, it was a time of tremendous creativity, energy, and enthusiasm. We all really thought we were gonna change the world. And I think in large measure, a lot of what we've seen over the last 40 or it's almost 50 years now has been an attempt to shut a lot of that down. And I, I, see, these, I see these powerful forces reemerging again in the current era. And that's very exciting to me. And I think we really need to tap into that if, in, if environmental learning, as I call it, is gonna remain relevant and innovative. Now, the reason why I call it environmental learning, by the way, and not environmental education, is because I think environmental education or the, the word environmental education, at least in North America, has been trivialized and, and people associate it with a certain kind of work. Whereas I wanna broaden what it means and you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. I always start though with this picture because it's a reminder of the extraordinary atmospheric, oceanic, biogeochemical, microbial circulation uh, and again, I apologize for the North American centrism of this, but this is connected. And of course the earth is connected to, it's a planetary sphere in the cosmos. 
And it's, it's such a precious jewel. And I, I, I think you can never be trite in reminding people of this beautiful planet and what it means to all of us. But you also have to remind people all the time that the reason why we do all of this, the reason why you have a Center for Excellence in Biodiversity, the reason why there's an Orion magazine, the reason why you're doing sustainability in Ankara, Turkey, is because we understand that there's a planetary emergency taking place now. And I always like to summarize what that is. I'm not gonna focus on it because it can get pretty depressing, honestly, but it's, it's good to remind us what the key features of it are. Those are these things, the sixth mega extinction. There have been five mega extinctions during the history of life on Earth. We are fully in, immersed in number six right now. Um, the first five were caused by a variety of things ranging from uh, uh, meteor strikes to uh, changing microbial relationships with the atmosphere to uh, continental plates moving around. But this one is clearly human caused so that it raises a whole range of existential and ethical questions. It's accompanied, of course, by plunging declines in biodiversity. And what I like to describe as rapidly changing atmospheric and oceanic circulations, which I feel gives us more of a context for what we mean by climate change. Because really what's happening is that all of these circulations, including the biogeochemical circulations and the microbial circulations, are all mixing in ways that are unprecedented and extremely rapid. So this is the challenge that we all face. And so, you know we see it every day in various ways. And I'll get more into some of the specific ways I think we need to address it shortly. So that's the reminder. Now what's also happened is that we are beginning to understand that environmental concerns are connected to other pertinent issues, economic opportunity, social justice, healthcare, racism, violent conflict and global poverty, but it's not always easy to make the connections between these issues and the ecological fate of the planet. So one of the points of my book, and I think what I see happening among a younger generation of environmental activists is they get this and they understand that the role of environmental studies in part is to make those connections more clear. So I wanna go over another way of thinking about those connections. And I wanna lay them out as what I call the tides of change. And there are four conditions that represent the tides of change. The first is the exploitation of the biosphere and its ecological systems. And the question for us, for all of us, is how do we best communicate the necessity of ecosystem thinking? Now, for many years, there were a lot of conservation oriented people in North America that assumed that they could just deal with that issue and leave the politics out. That is no longer the case. If you don't deal with the politics and if you don't deal with conditions two, three, and four, then condition one will never get solved. Similarly, conditions two, three, and four, if you're looking at those issues, and I'll speak about them shortly, if you're ignoring condition number one, that is the health of the biosphere, then your work is not comprehensive and your work is short-sighted. Condition two is the increasing disparity between rich and poor. And the question there is how do we promote economic equity and social justice in cultures of materialism and entitlement? Condition three is the apprehension concerning the integration and separation of global cultures. How do we promote intercultural understanding and cosmopolitan thinking in the midst of nationalist responses and ethnic chauvinism? This, this issue has always been with us throughout the, the history of, of uh, human evolution, but it has exploded in the last several decades. Um, you can't go a day without reading about this in an American newspaper, honestly, and it's, it's greatly troubling. The fourth is violence, weapons, and terror compete with uh, del deliberation, diplomacy, and collaboration. How do we settle our differences through community democracy, compromise, and service in the midst of conflict, extreme behavior, and fear. Now in the States, the conditions two, three, and four are customarily referred to as equity, diversity, and inclusion. Equity is the social justice uh, issue. Diversity really essentially is the race issue. And inclusion is the democracy issue. I've tried to place all of those in a more comprehensive way and frame them like this because they're historical questions. They're not just pertinent to this decade in the United States of America, nor are they just pertinent to let's say white supremacy 
in North America. These are global questions that are part of the human condition, and they all need to be solved, considered, and dealt with simultaneously. And our field of environmental learning, and I'm sure this is relevant, this is absolutely relevant in Rwanda. I mean, your, your recent history certainly bears that out. Uh, these, these things need to be considered simultaneously. And there are many trends also that are changing very rapidly when we think about environmental learning. We're moving towards an urban planet. By 2050, 80% of the world's population will be in cities. So if environmental learning does not have a very powerful and strong urban focus, it's not relevant. The idea of a cosmopolitan culture, despite all of these attempts to build walls, is inevitable. There's a great mixing of peoples. There always has been. And I'll say again more about that when I cover the question of migration. The issue of ecological inequity and social justice is on everyone's mind. And the way we perceive the world has changed very rapidly by all these new information networks and, and the cognitive orientations that are derived from that. And again, I will cover these issues. There are two issues I'm gonna cover in great detail, and that is the question of migration, which I think is the most pertinent issue of the century, and the issue of networks um, and how they ought to be taught and why they're so important to understand. And in the midst of all of this, we are dealing with the challenge of openness and vigilance. On the one hand, how do we remain open to lots of different points of view? And on the other, how do we stay vigilant around the fact that there are many people who just don't want to hear what your point of view is and would just as soon lock you up? So these are very challenging and interesting and important questions and intrinsic to all of our work. One of the, so I start the book after covering this ground by also looking at this concept of the Anthropocene. And I'll explain why. By the way, a lot of the artwork in, in this um, uh, slide presentation was done by my son, who is a uh, mural artist in Hobart, Tasmania. This is actually something that he did in Boston some years ago, depicting rising sea levels uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I, st I start this chapter by telling a little story. I'm sitting in my office, which you can see on the bottom left, which is a very enclosed, comfortable place filled with my books. And I'm looking at the screen. I may be surfing the internet. I may be preparing to write the manuscript of the book, which is now out. And I realize that my world is being completely, uh, miniaturized into these little portals. And all of my sensory awareness is, is, is microscoped down in a way um, and limited by this. Think about all the times you look at your phone or you walk down the street and you're just looking at your phone. And for a moment, you think that your entire world is enfolded in that little phone and all the places that you might visit. So in effect, our world has become a series of these electronic portals that seem like they're taking us everywhere, but really aren't at all. And again, I'm not a lot. I, I use the Internet a lot. I really enjoy it. But it does change the way we perceive the natural world. And we must understand this and teach about it. There has to be a balance here. So I, what I wind up doing is I look beyond the screen and I look in my office and I realize that every book is a portal. Every, every container of books is a curated portal. And then I look out the window and finally I go outside and I'm in the biosphere and the whole world opens up again and everything changes dramatically. So what I write about in this chapter is a concept called the deliberate pause, which I'll mention in a second. But here's the thing about this notion of the Anthropocene. It's often described as a new geological era in which humans have such an impact on the environment that they in fact are acting like a geological force. But the, the Anthropocene is two mutually conducive trends. One is clearly the global extraction of natural resources, but the other is the intensity of electronic connectivity. Because it's these things together that make it happen. You can't have this extraction of resources unless you have this connectivity. And what that results in is a dynamic perceptual reconditioning of human perceptual awareness. And this is a huge challenge for environmental learning right now. And then the question becomes, well, how do we reclaim autonomy 
in a time of global transformation? How do we get back to ourselves? How do we find ways of, re of, um, of really understanding how the internet and electronic connectivity so easily brings us down various rabbit holes, not of our own making? The algorithms guide us. How do we take control of these types of things? So in this chapter, I cover this at some length, and I focus on the notion of the deliberate pause. And what I mean by that is you take moments during the day, and how do you take those moments during the day to balance the electronics with being bringing your body back to the earth and the atmosphere and the oceans and all these great circulations? I spend a lot of time uh, in this book and in my talks talking about the notion of connectivity. And the reason why I do this is because I think that social networks are so dominating how we look at the world right now that we need to educate about social networks. And you'd be hard pressed to find a K through 12 school or for that, mal uh, for that matter, a college or university in North America where students learn how to think about networks. Yet there's nothing that can be more important in terms of their understanding their lives and their relationship to the natural world. So I start this chapter with this photograph of the Golden Spike in Promontory, Utah. The Golden Spike was the tie that connected Eastern and Western North America through the railroad. Now, interestingly, the American Railroad which was connected in 1869, just a few years after Darwin published The Origin of the Species. And there's an interesting uh, synchronous relationship here, which I'll mention, I'll say more about in a moment. This, the railroad was filled with fraud. It was filled with bankruptcies. It was filled with taking over indigenous lands. And it was mostly built by imported um, indentured labor. So there's a lot of, there was a lot of corruption. It, as a magnificent as the achievement was, it's also another reminder that you can never remove politics from any of these questions. But for the, our purposes, what was fascinating about the Golden Spike was now East and West were connected through a transportation network that could bring goods back and forth really quickly. And the commoditization of North America could begin in earnest because it was a lot more it, it was a lot quicker to bring goods this way than it was all the way around South America. Eventually, of course, the canal got built. But th this also conceptually, the railroads built on this whole no notion of networks. Interestingly, at this time, Darwin, who had gone around the world um, collecting data for his origin of species, Darwin was working at his office in, in England and the, the reason why he was able to do his work is because of the steam engine and the amazing amount of mail that was now going back and forth and the data that he was able to exchange with other colleagues around Europe and around the world for that matter. So all of this also was part of this incredible data collection process that has been so rewarding for so many of us. So it's always a double-edged sword. But what I try to do in the book is always show that there is a biosphere template. There is an ecological foundation for all of these social concepts. They're not always the same, but they are a template. So for example, if you think about the networks in your life and you start with the natural world, here are some examples. That's on the upper left, on the bottom, on the left, you see dendritic drainage a geomorphological concept. It's, look at those beautiful networks in terms of how water flows from one place to another. On the upper right, you see tree roots, and on the bottom right, you see mycelium. And what we're learning now about both tree roots and mycelium is that there's an extraordinary kinship and suite of communication networks that take place under the forest that really are beyond what we understand at this point in time. And part of the reason for that is, I mean, think about, for example, the number of mycelial scientists and soil scientists compared to the number of, let's say, bankers and lawyers. And you have a good understanding of why we know so little about this. But arguably, this is one of the most important scientific endeavors we could support. And that is to understand the mycelial networks, which the great mushroom visionary Paul Stamets described as the original internet. 
because this is really the fabric of our soil and the fabric of the connectivity. I'm, obviously, this is true in, in tropical Rwanda. So the, the, these are very important things to understand, and they provide us also with a template for how we begin to think about social networks. And if you think about the networks and movements, of course, networks bring us to migration of the natural world. Here, here, here's an idealized uh, map of some of the uh, Pacific uh, ornithological pathways that take place. I mean, the trips that, that these birds take are absolutely mind boggling. And we're still beginning to understand exactly what prompts this navigation. In fact, there's a recent book by um, uh, Scott Wiedensall called World on the Wing, in which he talks about just in the last 10 years, how much we've learned about bird migration. It was once thought that it was mostly some kind of geomagnetic under, uh, uh, relationship. But in fact, we're beginning to think that it might have to do with at the quantum level that, that birds are able to, uh, their birds are able to navigate uh, these terrains. And it, if you look at the ecological research, one of the fastest growing areas in ecological research is network analysis. Uh, understanding the connections in an ecosystem, how they matter, which ones matter, how they change through space and time. So this is a great frontier for anyone who studies biodiversity, of course. And on a fundamental level, of course, Beth, seed dispersal is a networking function of, of, of some kind or another that takes place across species. So here are some other examples of, of the dynamic visualizations that are uh, beginning to emerge as we consider networks. And if you notice the diagram on the right, I'm going I'm to get back to that. Forget about the content of it. We, we don't have time to really go through that. But just think about the, the structure of that diagram, because it's going to appear again in a very interesting way. Social networks, of course, are very crucial. And again, they're very rarely taught. And understanding your social network is a very important way of moving forward, both in your career and as a learner, um, but also as a way to make things happen as an activist. We know, for example, that most people tend to hang out in what are called homological networks. That is networks of similar minded people. And the problem, of course, is then you wind up in the so-called bubble where everyone's talking to the same people all the time. But innovative organizations and innovative people are nodes in networks. That is, they are exchange functions that are able to connect different networks together. And they can move through multiple networks. And there's a lot of social theory research, by the way, that bears this out. So in fact, Innovative organizations, innovative people are those that are able to move through multiple networks simultaneously. Just for fun, and I often do this when I'm working on a presentation, I'll take a concept and I'll put it in Google diagrams and see what comes up. So I put social networks in and here's what happened. So you can see these are very complicated, a very interesting thing to do. And anyone who's doing this could or should do it. I've done it with in a range of places, I've done it with the Harvard Office of Sustainability and other places as well, is you create a social network map of your organization. So you ask every person in the organization to create a, net, a, a network map. Who are the people that you're connected to? Um, and, uh, and then you bring everyone together in, in the group and you create a composite map. So who is your organization connected to? And then you ask the question, are we connected where we want to be? Are there groups that we need to be connected to that we're not connected to? And why aren't we? And then how do we reach out? Do we have individuals who can be nodes in those networks so that we can reach out? So those are just some of the questions that I cover in this chapter. And there are a lot of, by the way, throughout the book, educational activities. For example, I give lots of guidance about not only thinking about social uh, and ecological networks, but also infrastructure networks. So right now, as I'm sitting here at my house through, and I'm in, the, in a rural area, there are, there's a plumbing network. I'm connected to an electric network of, on, on the grid. What, how do these networks, uh, how do they work? And um, what happens when they go wrong? These are all very important questions to ask. Typically, we don't ask a question about a functioning infrastructure network until something goes wrong with it. 
If there's a power blackout, we ask that question. Otherwise, we take these things for granted. And I think it's not only important and interesting to understand them for all the reasons I mentioned, but also because they're quite beautiful to behold. To me, the migration question, and this merges from the network issue because movement is such an important part of the human experience and the human form of movement typically takes place as migration. So I'm gonna spend some time looking at migration now. Um, and I, to me, this is the most pertinent issue of our time. It doesn't, um, well, let me say a little bit more about why that's the case. We know right now, depending on what study you look at, and for anyone who's interested, I can refer you to any of these studies. In fact, my book, uh, my book um, chronicles all of them in the notes and in the bibliography, but you can write to me and I can certainly get you started with any of this stuff. One out of every, depending on what study you look at, between one and eight, one out of every 10 people on this planet is a migrant of one kind or another. And that's just people who move from one country to another. That's a lot of people. And then if you add migration within a country, that is people who just move from one place to another, let's say in North America, because that's what I know best, because of a hurricane or because of a wildfire uh, or because of COVID. The number of people who move from one place to another is absolutely extraordinary. And most of that movement is prompted by some type of environmental scarcity or environmental catastrophe, which then often prompts a political uh, challenge as well. And sometimes it's a political issue that prompts the migration. Often it is. And if you look at Europe, for example, in the early part of the 20th century, it was almost always political exclusion and some form of racism or anti-Semitism that was prompting these migrations. But if, or if you look at the, the colonization of North America, but we, but also it's it's the ecological and, and clim, climate um, challenge as well that re results in all of this. And what I want to point out is that, in my view, and from everything I've read and all the studies I've seen, human migration is a biosphere process. It's unique to how who we are as a species. Interestingly, just in a short period of time. Here are some of the world migrations since 1500. It's really quite remarkable. Some of these were voluntary, but many were forced. If you see the migration, for example, from Africa to Europe and North America, of course, we know that's the slave trade. If you see the North American migrations from 1500 on, um, you know, some of that was uh, forced in the sense that folks left Europe because they felt like they had no choice. And some of it was opportunistic. But it always, I, it always strikes me as incredibly ironic when we have all these anti-immigration movements that take place, where it's just about everyone who lives on this continent, North America, uh, is here as a result of displacing somebody else. So we have to keep all of these things in mind um, in, when we think about the migration phenomena. And if you think about, if you go further back in time, it didn't take humans very long at all to settle the entire planet. It's actually remarkable that just a, a few small bands of folks left Africa and wound up circulating around the entire globe in a very short period of time. Because if they hadn't done that, humans would not have survived. So migration is, is an adaptation of sorts. It's an evolutionary adaptation to changing environmental circumstances, to global environmental change. And right now we're in a process of global environmental change that's accelerated. So because the process of global environmental change is accelerating, we're going to see necessarily more migration. And everything that you need to know about a community, you can understand by how they accept new migrants. Because that's where human compassion comes into play. Yet, look at all these walls that are built around the world. I want to say again that um, I, I'm very, I, I hope I'm sensitive to the Rwandan genocide experience. And it's, it, it should be very clear and very obvious how easy it is for some type of notion of supremacy or scarcity or these two things linked together to result in catastrophe. And we are never very far away from that. And that's where the openness and vigilance question comes in. I say this as a European Jew. I, you can certainly say it for any African-American in the United States. It just takes a simple twist of a demagogue of the wrong sort to manipulate people in such a way that they take their anger out on a scapegoat. 
And you just look at the last 500 years of, uh, of history, and it's not just the West. You see it in China. You see it in India. You see it everywhere. And part of our challenge, you can never completely overcome this. It's so built into the notion of, of the tribe, but you can mitigate it through education. And I try to explain that in some detail in the book. At any rate, here are some of the walls that have been built around the world. The one on the upper left is the wall that separates, uh, that was built by, tried, they tried to build anyway during the Trump administration between uh, the United States and Mexico. The Great Wall of China, of course, a wall on the bottom right that separates Kuwait and Iraq. And on the upper right, it's Bosnia and Hungary. So we, you know, of course, the impact on species is another issue altogether as well. And in fact, a lot of the people who have been opposed to this wall on the American border, which is the one I can speak about, were, were ranchers and folks who understood the importance of species being able to move back and forth. But ultimately, a wall will not keep species out. A wall is trivial. A wall is ephemeral. It will never, ever last. Um, so here is a, this is a, that, remember I mentioned that diagram, I wanted you to look, uh, forget about the substance, but look at the concept of it. Well, here's another similar type of diagram that shows you the flow of people between countries uh, between mid 2005 and mid 2010. So you can see that it's just amazing the numbers of people that go back and forth at any one period of time. A, a really silly way to think about this um, I haven't flown that much lately for obvious reasons, but when I do fly, I'm always amazed at the luggage carousel in the airport. If you think about the fact that at any given moment in time, we're, there are thousands and th hundreds of thousands of pieces of luggage going around in circles in airports. And it's, it's, it's almost humorous, it's almost silly, but what does it say about the human condition and the fact that we're constantly moving around and constantly taking our things with us. So what does all of this mean? Well, again, if we go back to the biosphere template and we look at the continents just over the last 250 million years, we see that the continents are always moving. The continents are always shifting around. And species to adapt have to find new places to survive through those shifts. And if we come to the present moment, here's a map of springtime in North America. And it shows the incredible migration of species. Now, this is all changing because of climate. And that, that brings a whole bunch of very interesting unknowns to bear on the situation. For example, on the upper left, uh, you see the recent past, which is a biogeographical diagram of the major tree species. And you see what's projected 100 years from now. And clearly a lot of change is going to take place. Or you could look at the uh, migration of the monarch butterfly or any of these migrations. And they're all shifting in very interesting and important ways. The, how, the shifting of whales and where they feed and where they breed. Okay, I'm not gonna get into that one. So if you wanna look further at this, there are some really wonderful resources. You can, you can go to the UN and the International Organization for Migration uh, which is filled with terrific reports and the UN Refugee Agency as well. And these are some books that I have found very helpful in understanding this. National Geographic did a, a whole sur a survey of migration. Uh, the Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wil Wilkerson is about the African-American migration from South to North. And Sonia Shaw's great book, The Next Big Great Migration, uh, looks at um, migration from many different perspectives over the last several years, but also shows how um, ecological theory has a, a built-in bias that, um, that's, that's very interesting, that is, that is inherently racist. And I think th these are important things to look at and understand. Um, and a lot of the whole question about population comes into play here. So uh, the, I'm, I'm fascinated by the notion of cosmopolitan culture. I'm not going to spend as much time with this right now because we've already covered a lot of ground. But if you look around the globe, and if you look at what I call Anthropocene heroes, that are people, those are people in communities all over the world who are making a difference. It's absolutely inspiring what's happening right now. And in North America, you're never going to hear about it on the media. You know, you can, you can watch the mainstream media or you can look at Facebook or any of those things. And the really interesting grassroots on the ground projects just don't get the coverage. I did a project 
several years ago, and you could download it off my website called Pacific Northwest Changemakers, where I wrote about eight different projects in the Pacific Northwest of the United States that were multicultural and multi-generational and were focused on sustainability. Um, and I could have profiled several hundred of them. There are people all over the planet who were doing this great work, and we constantly have to remember that because there are people like you, and we are making a difference in ways that don't necessarily get covered. It's a long haul, and it's happening right now. The point I want to make, and I wish I could have had a map of Central Africa. To, I'm sure you can find a similar one if you do enough research. But this is a map of all the different language groups in um, North America prior to European colonization. So it turns out that North America was really quite cosmopolitan because many of these groups knew about each other and traded with each other. And there's all kinds of archeological evidence that bears this out. So human populations have always been inherently cosmopolitan and that's not to create some kind of romanticized glorification of all of this. Of course there was conflict and of course there was environmental deterioration in certain places. But we also know that each of these groups had a great deal of indigenous knowledge and when we lose the language, we lose some of that knowledge. There's a lot of work that's been done on this as well. And it's crucial, by the way, to biodiversity and conservation is that there's so much indigenous knowledge related to natural, the natural world and natural history and ecological relationships that's actually embedded in these languages which are going extinct. Okay, so um, just a few words about ecological urbanism. Um, Sometimes when we think of cities, we think of uh, the overwhelming possibilities of cities, but cities are really very beautiful places. And there's a tremendous role for art, ecological art, especially in cities. And if you look at the field of ecological urbanism, in fact, there's a wonderful book I have called Ecological Urbanism. And it's a survey, it's almost like a whole earth catalog of all the incredible projects that are taking place in communities all over the world. So those, it's all happening, it really is. It's extraordinary what's going on right now. And we're, we're on the verge of tremendous possibilities. I think in some ways this is a, uh, a self, uh, this, this is a very presumptuous thing I'm going to say. But I think we're, we have a new generation of environmental thinkers now that came out of all the interdisciplinary programs that come out of your program in Rwanda who have terrific knowledge and really know what needs to get done. So in other words, we have the solutions. It's almost like a tribe of poet intellectuals, scientists who really know what can be done, but we have to spend so much time overcoming some of the, uh, some of the politics and some of the stupidity, quite honestly, that it's very, very frustrating. But the knowledge is there, the passion is there, and you have it and you know it, and that's why you're here today. I'm gonna to cover the last couple of chapters in the book just briefly, because they also are part of my vision of environmental learning, and they do relate to the other chapters in ways. So I wanna say a little bit about them. I'm a great believer in the importance of improvisation in education, and what I call improvisational excellence, because I feel that in a time of rapid environmental change, there's always gonna be a new circumstance that you've never quite seen before. And to be able to understand that circumstance and adapt to it and think about it and teach about it, you have to be able to improvise. So I write a lot about what improvisation is and how it works and how you teach it and how you learn it, especially in relationship to the natural world. So if that interests you, I think you'd find this chapter of great interest as well. And I, I'm not going to go into more depth on it now, other than to say that it's another important feature of this work. And finally, another important feature is the notion of what I call perceptual reciprocity, because ultimately all of this comes down to deepening our awareness of the biosphere and the ecosystems. And my view is that everything on this planet perceives. That doesn't mean that it's sentient or it doesn't mean that it thinks about things the way that humans do. But I think a landscape perceives. I think all organisms perceive. Organisms make choices. Those choices may happen in different ways. And our challenge is how we tap in to those multiple perceptual realities. Because when we do that, we deepen our appreciation of the natural world. Humans are merely the biosphere looking back upon itself and contemplating itself. 
We are not separate. We are not apart. We come from the stars. We come from the planet. We are the planet. We are these other species. And what do we have to learn? In, in effect, observing the natural world, I write about this in my book, Bring the Bias for Your Home, observing the natural world and trying to place yourself in the perceptual field of another species is the last chance that we have to understand what it really means to be human. So one of the things that I propose, this is an interesting diagram that comes from a wonderful book by a man named Michael Pollan called How to Change Your Mind. And what Pollan does in this book is he shows the difference between the mind under ordinary circumstances, which is the left, and then the mind under psilocybin, which is on the right. Now, I'm not advocating the use of psilocybin or the use of any drug at all. But what I do want to point out is how this diagram, by the way, which looks very similar to those other diagrams I was pointing out, how when you open up the synapses, that's when the really incredible learning takes place. And so the challenge for environmental learning is how do we find ways of opening these synapses amongst those we work with and those we teach so that the deeper appreciation is possible and all of these openings can take place. And that is, that is the deeper awareness challenge that we all face as we think about uh, environmental learning. And that awareness and that deepening of awareness is not, is not just the natural world, but it's other cultures and other peoples and the long history of our of human um, habitation on this planet. And finally, we all belong to ecological neighborhoods. And these are some of the ecological neighborhoods that I profiled in the American Northwest. And these are people all who are making a huge difference. In the upper left are folks from Garden City Harvest, which is, it started with community gardens, but now it does social work and it works with, it works with the food impoverished. On the lower left is Living Cully, which is a, remote and poor neighborhood on the outskirts of Portland, Oregon, that's doing major work in ecological restoration. On the right is the, is the uh, Crow Nation and uh, the Centerpole Project, where they're doing a lot of work with indigenous food, where they're doing work with getting kids to college, all kinds of very interesting things. And as I said before, whatever your ecological neighborhood is, there are people who are making a difference and how do you engage with them and how do you bring the work that you're doing um, at either wherever you are right now in the world or whether you're the Center for Biodiversity Excellence, how do you bring your work to your community? And I'm sure that you think about that all the time. I, f I conclude the chapter, which what actually will be my next book, and that is the role of memory and learning, uh, especially environmental learning. And um, I, I, I feel that it's very important for us to probe our memory to think about those moments of awareness that we've had. And I, what I do is I look at a couple of things that were very important to me, a, a book called Harold and the Purple Crayon, which taught me about place and improvisation, a book called The Golden Guide to the Stars, which I had when I was five years old and taught me about infinity, but a toxic experience I had as a young boy, where I, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City. And when I was just five years old, they were spraying DDT. Uh, and the first time they did it, it was exciting. It was like, it was a cloud on the ground and let's all run through it. But then I got very sick and I got a headache and I realized well, there's something wrong here. There's a toxicity that I'm being exposed to. And you know, when I gave this talk about memory to a bunch of New York University students several years ago, every single student, and they were from all over the world, had some kind of toxic memory. So I think it's very important to explore our toxic memories as well as those memories of deeper awareness of the natural world and put them together and, and, and understand them and, and figure out what they mean and how they stimulate our learning in one way or another. So, so finally, to, to wrap this up, I wanna emphasize that, you know, if you're able to get a hold of the book, um, there are all kinds of activities in the book for taking what I'm talking about a bit more theoretically and sometimes very personally. There are a lot of personal stories in the book. And I provide ways of, of working them out either on your own or with a group of people or in a teaching setting. So that's an important part of all my books actually and certainly an important part of this one. Um, so um, please visit my website to get a sense of the work that I do, the place where I live. Uh, if you want to contact me, I, I love it. I, I really devote this 
this part of my life now, as I'm in my 70s, to service and being there for people. And um, I'm, I'm always happy to have a conversation with you about your work, uh, career, whatever ideas you may have, questions you might have. I'm a very um, faithful email correspondent, so please do get in touch with me if you'd like. And thank you so much again for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has um, or take it on from here. Well, thank you so much, Mitch. This this was really amazing and so many things to think about and uh, makes us want to read more books and get outside in nature and um, really do even a better job of um, our work in, in educating about the environment. So thank you. And I'm going to invite people to um, put their questions or comments in the chat or you're welcome to... Um, unmute and ask your question directly. If you want, you can also um, put your hand up in Zoom and then um, we can call on you either way. But um, let's get some questions and comments going here. Let's see. So Beth, you're gonna moderate this, yes? Yeah, I will. Um, I'm just looking here. At yeah. Yeah, well, um, while we're waiting for people, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get them posted into the chat. Um, while we're waiting on that, um, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, this idea of um, connecting to nature, because I think that's really, really um, a pretty critical issue. I know with students I work with here, and even with my colleagues, um, we seem to be so tethered to our electronic devices. And, um, you know, even me, I consider myself to be sensitive to going outside. But then when I listen to you talking, I realize, gosh, you know, I need to really pay more attention to that. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about why it is so easy for us humans to slip into um, satisfaction with um, being with our devices and not being with nature. Why, why um, do we let that happen? And, and uh, you know, do you have some strategies for why we can do a better job? And I'm asking because I do believe that um, we, we really can't succeed at um, especially for policymakers and uh, managers, um, we can't succeed at what we're doing if, if we don't have people who are more connected and not just understand that biodiversity is important because of the services it provides. And, you know, now it's all about um, the business of conservation, the economics of wildlife. But what about, you know, that love and that passion for, um, for biodiversity and nature? So, um, that's kind of a long-winded question for you. Uh, well, I, 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 you know, I, I can only look at my own behavior and, and agree with you that you know it's it's very appealing to uh, be on the internet for a variety of different reasons, and it, it's very easy to it, it becomes a form of addiction. Um, and I think I think part of it is that you know my my generation grew up with screens. I mean, we had television and we grew up with screens, and the internet becomes like you know you're very even if it's as small as a phone becomes your, it seems like it's your own personalized, you know, screen or station where you have two-way communication and, and humans crave connection. They absolutely crave connection and they crave gossip. Um, you know, someone smarter than me once described humans as, you know, essentially uh, two-handed apes, um, you know, who, who love gossip. And the internet is the, is, is the perfect gossiping tool. That's what social media is. We want to be involved with what other people are thinking. We want to have something to say. And there's been a decline of community along with the growth of the internet. That's absolutely clear. So um, that's a huge challenge for, for many folks uh, to deal with. And unfortunately, for many uh, people who are get, getting started out in their careers, I mean, even for me as a writer, everyone was saying, oh, you have to be on Facebook and you have to be on social media and you have to be on Instagram. And I don't want that personally because I don't want to be spending my time doing all of that stuff and I'm just going to sell fewer books. I, and that's just the way it is. You, you know, so you get, you, have, you get forced into all of that 
because that's the way everything happens. So I farm it out. I just say to MIT Press, oh, I'm going to give this presentation, put it on your social media. And whatever happens, happens. So I, I think that it, it takes tremendous willpower to, you know, refrain. I, again, you know, Gary Snyder, the great North American poet, uh, one in 1969, in fact, it was in the Whole Earth Catalog that I mentioned previously, once described his vision of computer programmers who walk with the elk. And what he meant by that, and I have a whole chapter about this in a previous book, is that you balance the visceral and the virtual. But the question is, it's got to be a balance. Um, you know, if, if you're out of balance and the world is out of balance, then you know that. I mean, you can feel it. Uh, you speed mm -hmm. up. It, it, you lose attention uh, you, or you're mm -hmm. watch if you watch any television now and you compare it, uh, watch a program and compare it to television 10 years ago. The frame rates are unbelievable. I mean, you I mean, if you count one one thousand almost almost every half second, the frame will change. There'll be something else. And 10 years ago, you couldn't have done that because people weren't prepared for it. So you know, there's an acceleration that takes place that it's very hard to extricate ourselves from. And that takes teaching and it takes learning and it takes personal willpower and it takes a form of meditation and discipline um, to say, well, I'm just going to use this for this purpose right now and then move forward. But I do think it is, it, it's very appealing for all the reasons that I mentioned. And that's why we get mm. all get so captured in it. Um, and that's why we need to talk about it, really. Absolutely. Right? So, yeah. I mean, there's no, I don't have um, any, yeah. Sorry, I just Hello. need to yes. interrupt. Hello. I have. Oh, go yes. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, this is the uh, Mwari Musheshe from Uganda. Mm. Musheshe. Um, yes, hello, Mitchell. Hello, <laughs> Musheshe. <laughs> nice, nice hearing from you. It's amazing. It is amazing. But I have a small, very quick question. By the way, Cindy wants to say hi, Musheshe. Here she is. Yeah, we do have yeah, a couple yeah. of other questions here from our. Okay, team, sorry, so, um, I yeah. sorry, it's, it's, but it's the human yeah. connection. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's a it's a small quick question. Um, you say you say Mitchell and very very assertively about the relationship between indigenous language and the indigenous knowledge. And I'm wondering in your work, how much are you working with the indigenous people of the world, but especially with reference to your country, Northern America? How, many, how much are they involved? How much are they learning from you? And how much are you learning from them in respect to the environmental questions? Well, that's a great question. And I, I personally don't have that opportunity right now. And I don't think that uh, nearly enough of that exchange takes place. But there are parts of North America where that exchange is becoming more prominent. You see a lot of it in the Pacific Northwest, actually. You see a lot of it in Western Canada. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done some, I did some work when I profiled uh, the Crow Nation in, um, in Montana, but uh, it's, not, it's not something that I'm engaged in. Uh -huh. very much personally. Um, but I think that more of that is beginning to happen in certain parts of North America. Great, thanks. Yeah. Mm. Good, thank you. Um, now we have um, a question from Laura um, and she was asking, is there a way of bringing back one's toxic memories without the associated feelings of pessimism and fear for the future? Well, that's a really great question, Laura. Um, I think you have to be very sensitive about how you do that kind of thing. Um, I think when, when you bring up the toxic memory, uh, one good thing that happens is people realize they're not alone and um, they, they have experiences they need to share and they may not have fully debriefed. Um, the second is that they, are, they have survived it and they're here and their work in the world is to ensure that, um, that their children don't have these same toxic memories. So I think, I think you can't escape them, 
but you can do anything, everything you can to try to remediate them, if you will, and move them forward into a positive future. You, you can't ignore the past because you're afraid of the future, I think. It's as simple as that. It doesn't take, you know, I can go back several generations in my family for, you know, for genocidal memories as a Jew. Um, and there are many families that wanted to protect their children from that. But eventually it comes, it comes out, it comes back. So what's happening right now in America in regard to, there's, a, there's an explosion of brilliant African-American scholarship about slavery and about white supremacy. And this is bringing up some incredibly if difficult issues for people, but it's also healing. And it's also an awakening. And it's a chance to understand another very dark side of American history that must be repaired if this nation is to survive. So it's a great question. And I'm, you know, I, I don't have any answer for it, but that's all I can say is how I think about it. And that's how I think about it. Great, thank you. And thanks for that question, Lore. Um, and, uh, I saw Jim Jordan made a comment. Um, the Whole Earth Catalog 69 and Harold and the Purple Crayon will always be a foundational touchstone for Mitch. And he wanted to know if you can find them online. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, sure you can. You can find a Harold and the Purple Crayon app, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. And, and the whole Earth um, catalog is, uh, there's actually someone who wrote a book on how to teach philosophy using Harold and the Purple Crayon. Mm. Amazing. Um, there's also a question from uh, my colleague Antoine in Sabimana. He asked, um, when, the, when the idea to become a writer, when did the idea to become a writer come into you and how did you start? Wow, what a wonderful question that is too. I didn't write my first book until I was in my early 40s because, um, well, I was busy building the environmental program at Antioch and, and helping my wife raise a family. Um, but finally, when the kids were old enough, um, I, I wanted to, and I was around a lot of writers. I mean, through, through, the, you know, uh, through my work, um, I was exposed to many. And I just realized I have, there's a point at which I had something to say. The, the challenge in writing a book, and you know, as I'm thinking about, I guess, what would be my sixth right now, um, is that when you write a book, you, th this is gonna sound a little egotistical, but I don't go back and look at my work very much unless someone asks me to give a talk about it. But when I go back and look at my work, I say, holy cow, how did I ever get it together enough to figure that out? And what I mean by that is you go into a space where you learn things that you didn't even know you had inside you. So what the writing process does is it brings your thinking to a higher level um, and it brings the best out of you in ways that you never could have anticipated. And there comes a time when you know you need to do that. There comes a time when you're gathering and collecting and curating and, and having ideas. And you just say, you know what? It's time to try to put this together as best as I can. And it's very hard to do and, and very challenging. It requires great discipline. And it's, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's fun for me, but it's incredibly rewarding. And the best part of all is when it's all done and you can connect with other people and hope that they are so inspired by what you've written that they will then write something really great. Not great, that was a good question. Well, it's um, almost 10 after four. And as I mentioned, we try to keep this to an hour so people can stay um, with their, their schedules. And um, yeah, you have some um, nice comments in the chat, Mitch, people um, enjoy the talk and um, yeah, maybe we can do one more quick one from Eve. What are your thoughts about how we can maintain the level of nature connect connectedness that we developed during COVID-19 pandemic? In the last year and a half, I noticed so many people hiking, camping, biking, et cetera. Um, 
I've thought for a while, I mean, it's so interesting because um, COVID has raised so many questions about discipline um, and freedom. And in America, people have mistaken uh, freedom for um, the ability to go without a mask. But in fact, I know this is not what you're asking, but I'm going to get to it. In fact, freedom is a civic responsibility. And what we've learned during COVID is that to be, the, to be most free, which is to rid the world of COVID, you have to sacrifice certain things. And, and in this case, it was wearing a mask. And there are a lot of lessons that we're gonna to have to learn about our inability to deal with communicable diseases and how that relates to how we think about climate change, by the way. Um, I think that um, what I've noticed, again, just speaking for myself, and it was pretty easy for me to be sequestered because we live out in, the, in rural New Hampshire. And, you know, my career is at a stage where there's just not a lot of obligation at this point, other than the things I choose to do. Um, but it was very painful not to be able to see my family and my grandkids and my daughter and my son, who's in Australia and I still haven't seen. And it was very painful not to see my friends. And it was very painful not to just go to town and see a, the smile on people's faces. Uh, and what I've been finding since over the last couple of months is I've taken tremendous joy in everyday encounters, uh, almost like a jubilee, like a, a celebration that, oh, gosh, I can see people again and I can hug a friend. And I think the most important thing for us is not to lose that feeling, uh, that it's, it's a great uh, privilege and, um, and wonder to have personal contact. Um, and we should never, again, take that for granted. And I think we can transfer that into how we think about the natural world, too. So I know that's not exactly what you were asking. But again, you know, so much of this is how you think about it, really. Um, and I think the same, the same concept can also be translated to, well, gosh, we can, we can get out again. We can get out into the natural world again. We can take great pleasure in that. That's really meaningful. I lost touch uh, because I was so embedded in my work. The most important thing is that we don't retreat right back into the old habits of doing things. We learn from what happened and make our lives better as a result. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mitch. Um, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you for the wonderful questions. And um, and the responses, yeah, we really appreciate this. In, in the COEB uh, seminars, we're used to a lot of um, data-driven, data-heavy talks, and so it's really refreshing, and I hope um, this can start us also on a trend of some um, really thoughtful pieces where we start integrating more about the data that we see and that we know with also how we think and perceive of the world. So thank you again, thanks everybody. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of the day and stay safe and um, come and join us again next week when we have our next seminar. Thanks and take care. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.